On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Savior of the world was fallen. His body on the cross, his blood poured out for us, the weight of every curse upon him. Heaven looked away, the Son of God was made in darkness. A battle in the grave, the war on death was waged, the power of hell forever broke. The ground began to shake, the stone was rolled away. your sting, a resurrected King has rendered you defeated, forever He is glorified, forever He is lifted high, forever He is to shake, the stone was rolled away, his perfect love could not be overcome, now death, where is your
he lives, we live. He is mighty to save. Everyone stand and sing with me if you can or if you want to. Everyone needs compassion, love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave jesus conquered the grave so take me as you find me all my fears and failures fill my life again i give my life to follow everything i believe in now i surrender hallelujah savior he can move the mountains my god is mighty to save he is mighty to save forever author of salvation he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world sing. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world sing. We're singing for the glory of the risen King. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. He's my Savior. He can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save, He is mighty to save, forever, author of salvation. He rose and conquered the grave, Jesus conquered the grave. Shine your light and let the whole world see, we're singing for the glory of the risen Jesus, shine your light and let the whole world see. We're singing to the glory of the risen King. Amen. Hallelujah. He is mighty to say. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. When striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. In Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God in helpless faith, this gift of love. Righteousness, scorn 
by the ones he came to save. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on him was laid. Here in the death of Christ, I of the world by darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day, up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, since curse has lost its grip on me. the precious blood of Christ. No guilt in life, no fear in death. This is the power of Christ in me. From life's first cry to final breath, Jesus commands my destiny. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck me from his hand till he returns or calls me home. Here in the power of Christ I'll stand. No power of hell, no scheme of man can ever pluck from his hand till he returns or calls me home here in the power of Christ I'll stand need some help on this one ladies the Lord is risen today, hallelujah. Dolphin and angels say, hallelujah. Raise your choice and triumph high, hallelujah. Sing ye heaven and earth. Hallelujah. Where, O oh, death, is now thy sting? Hallelujah. Once he died, our souls to save. Hallelujah. Where's thy victory, boasting grave? Ha 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 ha. 
Father, we just come to you this morning. You are a great and gracious, merciful, loving God. And you are so good to us. And your promises are true to us. And we're here, Lord, for you have risen. And you are alive. And we serve and worship and praise a living God. And it has been our joy to gather on this day, Lord, when we look back more than 2,000 years ago and we ponder again your great and wondrous resurrection. It is in the name of the Father, it is in the name of the Son, it is in the name of the Holy Spirit of God that we come to you, that we worship you, that we praise you. For you are great and mighty, and there is none like you. And we are reminded afresh and new, Lord, that our faith and our hope in you is not in vain. For you are the firstborn from among the dead. You have risen. You have risen indeed. 
And we, Lord God, as your, as your servants and as your children adopted into the family, have come to praise you and honor you and recognize you as the living God, the Son of God, the King of kings, the Lord of lords. And we say to you, Alleluia, Alleluia. Praise be the name of Jesus. This morning, Lord, I lift to you, the congregation, I know that you are able, more than able, to meet their every needs. And that being said, it is enough. There's not a need, Lord God, for you to hear the list. You know the list. What it is, Lord, for us as a congregation is to be reminded that you care for the sparrows and you know what we stand in need of. And you have promised that we are worth far more than sparrows. And you have shown it in your work there on the cross. And so meet the needs, Lord. And I know they're there. I do not diminish them in any capacity. But Lord, I would fail those who've gathered in your name if we didn't make you our focus. So Lord, meet their needs. And they in turn shall give you glory. Father, we come to you this morning. We pray for those who today may not know you personally, may not have that relationship, may not have experienced the new birth, being born again, being the adoption that is ours. They may not have experienced the reality of the resurrection, Lord. All they know is its history. And we lift them before you. They're called our neighbors. They're called, Lord, our neighborhoods. And we ask that you would give us, even on this day, as you lead us, Lord, you give us the witness. And we pray for them. We pray for our leaders. We pray for our city. We pray, Lord, for those who lead us in our workplaces. We ask that you would, would just bless them and that you would be with them and that you would help them, Lord, that they may do what is right and what is good, that they may do your will first and what is in the interest of those, Lord, they lead. We pray for our state. We pray for our nation. We pray a prayer as we have prayed each Sunday, Lord, celebrating you. A prayer giving thanks for your incarnation. We pray a prayer of thanks, Lord God, for the work of the cross, our salvation. We pray a prayer, Lord God, for your resurrection that we celebrate in a unique and special way today. Lord, for the hope that we have and the promise that is sure and true. We pray a prayer, Lord God, giving you thanks, Jesus Christ, as you now are at the, uh, seated at the right hand of the Father. And you intercede there on the mercy seat. You are the mercy seat as you intercede as our high priest for us. Jesus, there is no other words for us to say other than in our English language, we love you and all the people of God said and amen and amen well we were out shopping yesterday obviously we went to we, we, we first we went shopping for uh, craft supplies for for what Debbie would be doing back there and of course um, we we didn't start there she wanted some new shoes she got the hat, just want you to know, she got the hat from Pastor Jesse. Yeah, I love the hat too. I got one as well, I didn't wear it. Um, and then while we were out shopping for shoes, we came by this suit coat. I like it. She liked it. She bought it. <laughs> You're wearing it, she said. I said, okay. I'm here to tell you God is good. And all the time. I'm here. I'm here to make a statement to you, an affirmation to you. Jesus Christ has risen. He has risen indeed. The early church greeted one another with that greeting. It went on for, for several centuries, actually. It was how we, 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 didn't, we didn't open the door. Or we wouldn't have opened the door and shook your hand and hand you a bulletin. We would have said the first thing out of our mouth, He has risen. Yes, he has risen indeed. It's the cornerstone of our faith. Well, I'm already getting started. Whew. I'm excited. Can you tell? 
I'm, exci I'm excited. I, I, it's just such a wonderful day. Della walked through, and I thought I was going to cry. It's good to see you, sis. Doris, I mean, I, I wanted to get my hug, hug a thon going, you know? <laughs> Pat, Dennis, Joanne, good to see you. It's good to be back in the house of the Lord, isn't it? And for those of you online, we're, we, we're not, we don't mean that in a bad way. We, we're glad to have you, too. Um, I, I need, do need to make an apology, though. Um, we don't know why. That's one of the reasons why we started a little bit late is because Cheyenne and I were back there trying to figure out. But for some reason, the one program that has the window, aren't you glad you're here today, Doris? Um, the, one, the one program that has the, the window with the, this video stream coming that's supposed to go live, they keep, we're back there trying to figure out why it was saying it will start in an hour and three minutes from now. So whoever's online, and if they're not on YouTube or on Facebook, they're going to be an hour behind. We've, we've messed with their, with their lunch time. Not that we don't do that every week. God is good. And all the time. I'm back there with my three-year-old grandson. It was exciting. He's trying to sing the words, hallelujah, with me. I told him, you're singing great. He gets the, the luyas gone, you know. And I was thinking about that. As much as it thrilled me, how much more does it thrill our Savior when we sing his praises? I am excited. It, it's, it's interesting for me. Um, I had a sermon all typed, and, and uh, I didn't, I'm glad I didn't print it. Um, I usually wait till Sunday morning to put my PowerPoint together, as some of you have probably already figured that out by the mistakes that are in it. But uh, I woke up this morning. Um, Jennifer, Jennifer's allowed to come back here, Matt, and stay with us. Okay. <laughs> so I, I woke up this morning, and God changed the message. So Debbie said to me, she woke up, I don't know, a couple hours later, and, and um, she said, what, um, what you doing? I said, I'm typing like a fool. Like a maniac, God was speaking to me. I love it when God speaks to me. He most often does speak to me. I, I, it's interesting. It's just the relationship. I don't know. I'll go with it. Uh, it works. It's kind of like me and Debbie. When it works for me and Debbie, I'm, I'm, I'm with it. You know, it doesn't have to make sense to me. And the Lord, there she comes. Good to have you, Miss Jennifer. We were just calling you back. Give you a break from the baby. Um, and so God, God began to sp speak to me and, and said, uh, you know, and, and I'm like, okay, okay. So we're going to roll with this. Tim, you've got notes. I typed them out. I don't know what good that will do. I doubt if I stay with them very close. I think it has a lot to do with the fact that God, as he's speaking to me, one of the struggles that we have in our culture and in our world today, both um, in the Western, at least on the Western Hemisphere, um, most of the Eastern culture follows uh, other religions, although there is Christianity there, but they're doing their best to snuff, snuff Christians out. Um, Jesus promised that, uh, us that that would take place. He, he told us that it would happen and that uh, there would be martyrs, and there's a lot of them. There's actually more martyrs, martyrs, Christian martyrs today than there has ever been in history. Well, one of the problems that we have, and we have it, and it's a, it's a church problem, is that we're not people of the book. We get all our God knowledge. It's called theology, by the way. From the social medias, whether it be the news or the political arena, they, they like to preach. Or Facebook or YouTube or TikTok. Is that what it is? TikTok and Twitter and our friends at school and co-workers how many times have we heard yeah Tim see this isn't even in the notes how many times have we heard you know well that's not the Jesus I know 
And I scratch my head and think, well, <laughs> we must not be talking about the same Jesus. But what do I know about Jesus? I, I know in my personal relationship with Jesus and that which I have, uh, even though I've not seen him with my eyes, um, I know that he's real and I know that he's there. I see him. I see him in so many things. And my relationship with him is, can be just, just so hot. I don't, I don't know how else to say it. And so God was speaking to me this morning. What better day than Resurrection Sunday for us to focus back on the word that is kept, the promise kept. In fact, that's the title of this message, a promise kept. He is a God who keeps his word. Hallelujah. What God says he will do. And when he says, I will die at the hands of sinners, and in three days he says to his, his disciples, then I will rise, you will see me again. They couldn't comprehend. Until the day known as Sunday, the first day of the week, and he rose. This key verse from this is in Luke 24, 6 and 7. It says, he is not here. The announcement of the angels as the women went there. And we're going to read that account in just a moment. It was read earlier. He is not here, but he has risen Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he told you. Of all the things God has ever done, the one thing that turned the universe upside down, it changed the cosmos and forever changed the course of history is the promise kept that you and I celebrate today. He is risen. He has risen indeed. And the church started out celebrating that even in their greeting. He has risen the promise of the death and the resurrection of, this, of God's Son was kept. This promise of resurrection kept by God is foundational to the Christian walk with God. It is the cornerstone. It is a building stone that we build off of. Um, it is a part of what the work of Christ um, and it was what actually finalized the work of the cross. It was how believers in the first century greeted one another uh, because this truth was disclosed on the first day of the week following the Sabbath. The church has adopted Sunday as the day of worship of God who kept his promise. And so I would like to, for you and I, to read the account. I'll have it up on the screen for you, but I hope you have your Bible. I hope you bring your word. You may have it like I have it in a, an electronic device, and that's quite all right. There doesn't mean that you have to have the book in this venue. There are other venues, okay? But you need to be people of the book, people of the word. Let me just read uh, the resurrection account there from Luke's gospel. I'm going to talk a little bit from all four gospels, um, but, I, but I'm going to focus in on this particular gospel. I like what it has to say. We're going to talk about some of the struggles that we have. Um, so the resurrection, uh, the resurrection, according to the gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, the, starting with the first verse. But on the first day of the week, that's Sunday, they had waited all 
day Saturday. From sundown Friday, Jesus is crucified. They get him into the grave real quick. And now we find that they had a whole day of nothing but waiting. And here it is, Sunday morning. The sun has yet to rise. There's dew on the ground. Can you imagine the journey that they're about to take? There's more than... We suspect more than four women actually doing this. What I find is interesting is that the gospel writers seem to only single out two to three at a time. But there's actually more women there, we believe, than uh, what, the, what would seem at first glance from the gospel writers. And I, and I love it because certain gospel writers will talk about and they'll name them and they'll name different women. And so we know that, that there was this group of women who got together and they, the first women's ministry is, is about to take place. And on that first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. By the way, these are angels in the form of men, not uncommon. Verse 5, and as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? Interesting question. He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day, rise. Do you remember? And they remembered his words. Oh yeah, that's right. I forgot. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven. That's the disciples. These are the men. And to all the rest. Now. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James uh, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But, all, but these words seemed to them, referring to the apostles who were hearing, an idle tale, an old wives' tale. And they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home, marveling at what had happened. Father, I've read your word. We've read your word together. We honor your word. We're thankful for your word. Lord God, if it wasn't for your word, how else would we remember? And we celebrate, Lord, not only your word as we remember fresh and new this day of your resurrection. You have risen and we serve a living God. Oh, Lord, that is cool. Honor your word, Lord, by allowing your spirit to teach today. As we listen in and speak, Lord, as you have spoken to me. And we'll leave here, Lord, forever changed, remembering what you said and living forward out of what you've said. And we say to you in Lord, thank you for keeping your promises. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let me just share with you one of the things as we read through the account and I made sure to point out is that, there, that, that we have struggles in, in um, resting in God's promises. God tells us things and we, we struggle with it. And there's a lot of reasons why we struggle with it. And, and we'll, we'll discuss that. You know, but I, but I, but I just, I, I love this account as those women were, were heading, headed in. Do you notice that um, as they went in, I, I can't 
think of anything else than a chilly morning. It's still dark out. They're rising out of what seems to be a dark cloud over, uh, over uh, all of Jerusalem. And anybody who, who knew Jesus was down, depressed. And it was, it was just a dismal thing. But here are some women who, who didn't really know what to do other than in the moment and just follow through with what we always do when people die. There has to be the work that needs to be finished. It got started. It got started when Jesus was taken down from the cross, but but the Sabbath was approaching quick, and so the two who took him down, they, they anointed him as best they could, but everybody knew that it wasn't done in the proper fashion. Well, go figure. Jesus didn't intend it to be done in the proper fashion. He had other plans. Hallelujah. He didn't have any intention of staying in the grave. He didn't need to have a Full anointing and embalming. But here are the women headed up. Because, why? Because they love Jesus. What, what do they do with it? Now their hope is dashed. All their hopes are dashed. And as they make their way, you, they, I, I pictured them in the dark. One with a lantern guiding the way through the gates of the city. And headed on out into the, the, the area where the tombs are. And the, another couple with ointments and bottles and a basket. And perhaps some strips to finish the job and they were going to go and take care of what is left of Jesus. So they thought the conversation that must have happened as they're going through, what about the stone? There might be five or six of them, but you know, gals, they're not Mr. Atlas and they can't push the stone. And they're probably in their love and in their works thinking, well, we'll find a way. I imagine they may even talk about how they could do it and get a, a large stick and perhaps stick it under. And I've seen that done and make a fulcrum. And they were probably discussing all of this and perhaps giving instructions, one taking lead to the other. You know how women do? And we need to make sure that we get enough ointment on his face. And you can understand the conversations that must have been happened. And as they're talking about this, their hearts are aching and they are mourning and they are, they are just in a dismal state, but they want to do it right. And as the light from the lantern shines in the darkness as they approach the tomb, they find to their surprise that the stone has been rolled away. One problem solved already. You can imagine there was a little lighter step in the, in, as they were stepping towards. And I see them, one slowly going in, probably the eldest, because they would respect and leading the way in and in there and hearing the gasp. <gasps> and another lady coming in and you can just hear it. It's like being in the kitchen with the ladies. Oh my. <laughs> what have we here? Just some rags. And another coming in, where did they take him? And a couple others setting baskets down thinking, what do we do now? And all of a sudden, as the lantern is shining in the tomb, around them is another couple gentlemen who begin to glow like lights. Why do you look for the living among the dead? He's not here. And they weren't so depressed and they were on top of their game that it probably said, well, duh. Do you remember what he said when he was with you in Galilee? Some of the struggles that we have are just like theirs. You know, they had been told there was a resurrection to happen. Jesus himself had told them. 
He didn't tell them once. He told them multiple times. They were told, I, I, I was going through, and, and, I, and I didn't count them. I wish I had now. Uh, but as I was going through and looking over and over and over, he would tell his disciples and he would tell his entourage that he was going to die and he was going to be raised again. When he was up on the Mount of Transfiguration, guess what they were discussing? What that would look like. When he was headed there in, in the last day, the what, Thursday, he was telling them again, there it is. When they were on the road, he told them, Peter got, got, he, he, Peter got in his face and said, there's no way you're going to be crucified. And he said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Over and over they had been told. And yet we find them, we find them worrying about how to roll away the stone and gathering up ointments and bringing the best and finding strips and baskets and finding the, 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 the lamp the, and to make sure it has enough oil to last until we get the job done and we got to get her done. And as I look at the story, I see that there and there's the men, and you know, as men folk, we always like to sit around the table until you get, get it all set there in front of us, and then we're happy to enjoy. And so the ladies, as they do the ladies' work, and I find it interesting, are the first to be told to be the witnesses. And um, when you read the story in all four accounts and piece it together, Mary Magdalene is the one who runs back ahead of all the other women and tells them, right away and and we know that John and Peter run to the tomb and they check it out but but notice what it said that they were critics imagine that conversation ladies you go back and say look you won't believe what happened Jesus is not there and the angels came and and and, and we, we the light was in the in the tomb but it wasn't our light it was like a light from from above and and they they they, they they look like young men, and they, and they shone. They're like their their clothes were like from heaven for sure. And and we we just want you to know Jesus is dead. And those men know better because why they watched him die there on the cross. And and they probably said something like, well, "You're foolish. We, you what's wrong with you, girl? You have seen him with your own eyes. You know that he was dead." And they were skeptics and critics. Now let me interject. Let me just stop and pause. God's word will last forever. God who makes promises never fails to keep them. But we're like them, aren't we? Both the disciples and of both genders. And guys, sometimes we're like the ladies too. Nothing like a bunch of men getting together like a bunch of hens. I think one of the struggles that we have and that they had, and so they had these struggles then and we have them now, is, um, and I've seen it show its head in my own ministry and in my own life and certainly in the ministries of various ministries in the church and people who get discouraged and things uh, don't work out the way they planned. This thing that I call unrealized expectations. You know, it's been interesting when God called me and I, I said yes to the Lord. I knew I'd go to school. I didn't know what that would look like. I, I figured I would be learning. I, I figured I would, when I got done and got my degree, I would know it all. Um, if I act like a know-it-all, slap me, please, because I know that I don't. 
And um, I, I had uh, these visions in my head that were expectations. We all have them. We have self-expectations. So you moms know what I'm talking about. You have expectations if you have children, how you're going to raise them, what kind of kids they're going to turn out to be. Dad, you do the same. You have expectations of yourself. And I, I was no different, and I don't think these guys were any different. And when Jesus is telling them that on the, he would be handed over to sinners, and uh, on the third day he, was, he would rise, uh, um, and what they beheld there on Friday, what we call Good Friday, and if you weren't here, if you weren't here or didn't tune in on, on the stream um, Friday, it was exciting, but uh, it is a Good Friday. It was a bad day for Jesus. It was a good day for all humanity, uh, but what they beheld certainly, I don't think, was what they expected, and th what they were expecting was unrealized, at least until this particular Sunday came. But, but ministry isn't anything like I thought it would be. That, that image I had in my head was like, man, duh, that was the dumbest thing. What, what, what was I thinking? And, and you guys know what I'm talking about. Life, life just does that. We, I'm going to walk with God. We, I, I think one of the first uh, un, unrealized expectations that I had is I thought that when I gave my life to Christ, that my life would be from then on better and, um, and, and, and let me just pause for a moment because my life from that point on has been better, okay? But not in the way that I thought it was going to be. The first thing that ever happened to me as a Christian, I was a Christian about six months. I'm walking with God and I'm thinking that, um, you know, God is going to take care of me and everything is going to be hunky-dory and everything is going to be wonderful, there's, there's some balloons back there in the, in the back room, and I'm thinking everywhere I go, there'll be balloons all around. Life's going to be really good. No problems. Six months knowing Christ, my father has a, a aneurysm in his brain. He's 51 years old. I'm 21. And he dies. And I remember standing in the hospital as he is there and his heart was strong and he was basically uh, a vegetable at that point. And if he, if he had lived, he would have been never recovered from what he was. He was in uh, a massive stroke in the middle of his, in the center of his brain. And uh, they showed us the, the MRIs and the CAT scans and, and, and the blood just kept pressing his, his brain towards his skull. And he lived Actually, 24 hours. He, this happened on 4th of July. And uh, he lived um, till the next morning. And that evening, on the 4th of July, I stood at this big window at the end of the hall. Judy, seems like every hospital has a big window at the, end of the, at the end of their halls. I remember being with you, with David, and those were long days for you. Um, you're a lot more mature than I was in those days. But I remember, th this is my expectation, and I, I remember standing there, and I remember, like, like my grandson, a three-year-old, but he wasn't doing this today, by the way, but, but I, 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 I balled up my fist, and I shook it towards the sky. I thought you loved me. And I was talking to God. I thought you cared. See, we all have these expectations that we dream up and visualize in our, in our minds. And there's nothing wrong with that. And by the way, God was okay with me shaking my fist to a point within reason. He knew I was six months in him and I was but a babe in Christ. And he was big enough and he loved great enough. That he could work me through. As long as I didn't give up on him, he could help me through. And it took me several years. I mean many years to actually sift through that. I think that's what was going on there on that day. When they walked into the tomb. Or when they announced the greatest news of ever to to the apostles, the eleven, and they are like, ladies, 
What is wrong with you? Have you been drinking the ointment? Are you sniffing that stuff or what? <laughs> Nothing about God's promises to you and I play out the way we see them going over in our head. My oldest son, Matt, you'll appreciate this. James says this often when something goes wrong and and we're working on something and it goes south, you know, he drops a screwdriver or something. He he says, well, I saw that going different in my head. Where So instead of waiting on God to unfold his plan in front of us, what we tend to do is what they did, just move on in disillusionment that God isn't working at all. And I want to remind you, if you finish reading this text in Luke that I started on, it, Mark, uh, Luke, jump, yeah, Mark, Luke jumps right into the account of the Emmaus Road. So does John. John tells about that as well uh, on the way to Emmaus Road. But what I want to point out to you is that when, even when Jesus kept appearing to his disciples, he kept reminding them of what he told them before he died. Do you remember what I told you? You, on the road to Emmaus, what, what, the stranger, and he shared with them from, from the word everything that w- was foretold that this should take place, this must take place. And they were, they were looking at him, this stranger, and they thought, what is wrong with you? In fact, John records that they thought, what was wrong with him? Did, did you just come from Jerusalem? Can, how can you not know what just happened there? And yet we find it's Jesus and he's reminding them of God's word. What was he saying? God keeps his promises. May not be like you think it is. May not be like I think it is. The other thing that um, uh, that I would share with you that I think we struggle with is skepticism. It affects us all. The world world was skeptic then and the world is skeptic now. Uh, skeptics are those who actually cause doubt, even within the church. We get out there, we get among some folks, and they start, you know, they start being skeptics, and we start buying it. And so you got women and who, who don't know what else to do with these 11 guys. We, they, she, they know that they must love Jesus as much, and certainly Peter did. He, he loved enough to go out and take a look for himself. But even then, if you read the scriptures, even then he was perplexed. And then there is the other thing, mockers, mockers. We hear a lot of mocking. People mock God's word then, and it's mocked now. I can't, I, I could just go down, you know, and we, we look at our culture. I could, I could pull from the internet just, just thing after thing after thing after thing. Hiya, Declan, um, about, about those who would mock the word of God. And... Um, we, I just want you to, I want to point out uh, when Jesus was on the cross, Mark tells this account, Mark makes, makes note of it, of what the high priests and the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees and those of the high religious court of the day. Here's what they said, Jesus is hanging on the cross, and those who passed by uh, de- derided him, wagging their heads and saying, Aha, you who would destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days, save yourself and come down from the cross. If you read some other of the accounts and you read earlier in, in this account, you find out that, that they were saying, You have claimed to be the Christ. Do this. You said you could, you could rebuild the temple, save yourself from the cross. Let's see you do that. You saved others. How, are you not going to save yourself? And they mocked him. And so, you know, there, there is just this whole issue of unrealized expectations, skepticism, and mockers who affect us. And then there's the other problem that we have, just simply remembering. And what a, what a case, what a case for us to be people of the word, children of the book. Christians just don't read and study the word like we should. 
And it gets us into trouble. And we find that the angels there with the women had to say to them, he, he's not here. He has risen uh, just like he said he would. Um, don't you remember? And then they were like, oh, yeah. He told you this would take place that when you were in Galilee. And, and it just, it just, you know, and I, and I suggest to you and I, why, why wouldn't we want to be in his word? It's full. It's chucked full of promises that get us through the dark days between from Friday to Sunday. If those promises were the focus, what a story would be different, wouldn't it? Promises of good things that are necessary to get us through our darkest days of our life. The other thing that I see is that we wrestle with so often is living in the moment. We look at our culture today and we look at our young people and we, we, we blast them. At least if you're my age or older or close to my age under. Tim, you're younger than me. And we blast them, you know, they, they're so short-sighted, you know, they, they, can't, they can't see very far, they don't look very far down the road. And then I remember when I was 18, I got married at 18, what was I thinking? She was pretty, yeah, you're right. And I wanted to snag her before anybody else did, that's what I was thinking. But she would tell you, she's older than I am, a year and a half, and she was 20. But she would say, what was I thinking? Ask her if you don't believe me. <laughs> we'd still marry each other, and we'd do it all over again, but probably not quite so young. Living in the moment. Those ladies were living in the moment. All they could think of is, is not what he had told them earlier. All I could think of is we got to take care of this process. How are we going to get it done? Those men were living in the moment. You and I know from experience, even as recent of this week, that life and time presses on. And it presses on for them in their moment. There was the Sabbath that actually was probably frustrating at that point. But they honored it and they kept it. But it was in the way of finishing the burial process. I meant a whole day had to go without getting this job done. And probably one of the things they were thinking is when we get there, will he stink? The Sabbath was in the way. The burial process needed done. There was the death of their only hope. Now all that is in the moment is darkness. Dismay. Discouragement. Yet they loved him. So onward they went, doing the best they knew how. And there's nothing, nothing wrong with that. But I just want to remind us that sometimes living in the moment is to our detriment. And we lose sight. The moment, really the problem with living in the moment is that it is emotionally loaded. In those times we need to remember God's word. And we need to remember it the most. Least we make an emotional decision such as Adam and Eve did, living in the moment. Another thing that I notice in this word is that, uh, in this text, is that the angels asked an important question. Why do you look for the living among the dead? I find it interesting that people did it then and people do it now. Looking for God, I call it, in all the wrong places. We, we look for God, we want information about God, we Google it. Nothing wrong with that. I do that when I'm looking to find something. Maybe somebody out there knows and I Google it. 
but I don't let that be my definition. I then open this up and say, yeah, that does match up. Or, dude, I'm not going to use that guy again. But looking for God in all the wrong, uh, wrong places. We, we have a culture who wants God out. We want God out of our schools. We want God out of our government. We want God out of um, our workplace. Um, we don't want believers coming in, you know, practicing their religion, um, especially Christians. I should. There's no place for that. We, we want God out in the Chief priests mocked him and railed on him, and they, 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 as he wasn't, as if he wasn't the Christ. Or he certainly didn't want, they didn't want him as their Christ, and they didn't want him as their Savior, and he wasn't what they were looking for. So, um, they were looking for God in all the wrong places. I find it fascinating. People go and look for all kinds of spiritual help in all kinds of places, and they'll look to any religion, but they don't want to hear about Christianity most times. So let me just recap. They look for God in all the wrong places. Why do you look for God among the dead? Remember what Jesus said about there are those who are alive in Christ, and then there's those who are dead. They were... Um, for you young people, it would be like zombies, okay? I hate zombies, but I don't watch zombie movies. It would be like zombies, the walking dead. So looking for God in all the wrong places. Living in the moment. Rem a problem with remembering. Dealing with mockers and skepticism. And unrealized expectations. Oh, it was all there. I want to close. What I want to close with is some promises. I want to start with the promises kept. Because there's still some promises that he's going to keep. Why do you look for... Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen just at, like he said. And it's key and core to who we are. We have a living, the scripture says, a living, we have a living hope. And as I close with promises, let me reread again the key verses as they were gathered in Galilee, Jesus, um, uh, about the resurrection. As they were ga gathered in Galilee, Jesus said to them, this is Matthew 17, um, the Son of Man is about to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him, and he will be raised on the third day. And they were greatly distressed. But he kept his promise. God came through. Let me share with you what the writer of Hebrews says in 13.5. For he has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. We have a God who gets up with us when we rise up and tells you, Hey, Carl, how about rewriting your sermon for me? I need you to tell them something important. I want them to know. I want the whole world to know. I keep my promises. Tell them, I will never leave them. I'll never leave them alone and forsake them and leave them on their own. They can shake their fist in the window at the sky and accuse me and I'll be there. Romans 8.31, what then shall we say, Paul writes, to these things if God is for us? Who can be against us? And it's a promise. And you can bank on it. Put some stock in it. Invest your 401. Roll it over, baby. And I love, if you ever get a chance, just read the 14th chapter of John. It's chock 
full of promises in, in a compact place. 14, 16, Jesus says this, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. He's referring to the Holy Spirit. To be with you forever. Verse 19, a little further down, yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live. Get this, get this, because I live, you too will live. And then he goes to the grave. And he raises from the grave. He keeps that promise to tell you that this promise is absolute. I want to read to you. I have it here for you. That 14th chapter. Tim, have Adam throw her up there. Or Tim, you're in control of it. The 14th chapter, first three verses, opening verses. I love them. I preach them at funerals often. This is a promise for you and I, for our future is just like the last one was. Because I live, you too shall live. Jesus says this to us. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. And the inference here, by the way, is that there's one. Hey, ladies, got all your favorite window shades on it. Because he knows you personally. Jen, all the knickknacks are going to be in the right place. You don't have to count on Matt anymore. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Dennis. Where you are now, and I look up out over that hill, look across that field. And it's almost your own piece of heaven, right? Well, I got news for you, buddy. You're getting a real piece of heaven. And you open your picture window with your honey's favorite shade on it. And you won't have to worry about putting it on there, Dennis. Because God's already got it. And you just aren't going to believe your eyes. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I promise, I promise, I will come again and will take you to myself that where I am, you will be also. And I'm here to tell you this morning, straight from God, that God keeps his promises, folks. So let me just ask you in closing, are y'all leaning on the promises of God? That, there's a song like that. I just realized I could have sang that in closing. Let me pray for you. Father, I just come to you. I thank you for who you are. Thank you for your word in our life. I thank you for this celebration. And I pray, almighty oh, God, that you will cause your people to lean hard, to lean in to the promises of your word. Remind us in our darkest hours. And we thank you that you're a God who keeps your word to us. And Lord, allow us to... Uh, to Hide your word in our heart that we might walk with you in an upright and holy way. And all the people of God said, and amen, and amen. May God 
cause his face to shine upon you. May he bless you. May he keep you from now to everlasting. In Jesus' name, go in God's peace.